Welcome to the Get Fit Guys Quick and Dirty Tips to Slim Down and Shape Up. My name is Brock Armstrong, I'm the Get Fit Guy, and let's look at the pros, the cons, the science, and the language of CrossFit. As I began the adventure that led to this podcast, I was sitting at the breakfast table with my first cup of coffee, preparing myself for a new fitness adventure, CrossFit. I know, I know, I'm the Get Fit Guy. How can this be the first time that I've done CrossFit? I mean, it's 2017 and CrossFit is certainly not new. Well, let me tell you. I have raced 10Ks, half marathons, full marathons, triathlons of every distance, done Zumba, bar classes, mass gain programs, yoga, calisthenics, boot camps, spin classes, swim meets, hockey, soccer, tennis, baseball, and I'm sure I'm missing a few things on that list, but for the first time, I was heading to the local CrossFit box to engage in something that I've been hearing about for at least 15 years now. For nearly that entire 15 years, I've also been hearing about a ridiculously high incidence of injury coming from the CrossFit community, and that alone is one of the major reasons why I have steered clear up until now. So why now do I throw caution to the wind and decide to brave this body breaker? Well, in a nutshell, not only do I believe in my own ability to say when enough is enough, but... I've also heard that even the inventor of CrossFit, a guy named Greg Glassman, has acknowledged the inherent problems with this workout regime that leaves 19.4% of his devotees lining up at physiotherapists, sport massage clinics, and chiropractic offices. In fact, when I dropped in to ask about the pricing at my local CrossFit box, the strapping young lad who did the sales pitch clearly directed me to the two to three times per week package rather than the five to seven days a week plan. And that gave me hope that they have learned and changed with the times. In a past Get Fit Guy diatribe, Ben Greenfield said, The problem with CrossFit is A, unfit people who join a CrossFit gym getting pressured into performing advanced exercises with poor form or when they're very tired. B, fit athletes getting pressured to compete against their peers even when they've already trained hard the day before. And C, CrossFit coaches who might get lazy and simply start creating random workouts because those workouts are quote unquote hard or interesting. But when applied intelligently and with good form and programming, I actually think CrossFit workouts are a great way to get fit really fast. All right, Ben. Well, there's a new get fit guy in town, so let's take another look. According to the official CrossFit website, and I quote here, the CrossFit protocol is designed to elicit a substantial neuroendocrine wallop and hence packs an anabolic punch that puts on an impressive amount of muscle, though that's not our concern, strength is. Now, as much as I enjoy carrying some extra muscle around these days, for health reasons and also for vanity, I'm only human after all, I like the idea that simply packing on weight is not the only goal that CrossFit has. Getting strong is a lifetime pursuit that all of us should strive for, and if you want, you can go back to Get Fit Guy episode 345 that was called What Do We Mean When We Refer to Fitness? But let's unpack the rest of that jargon-filled statement from the official CrossFit website. Let's start with elicit a substantial neuroendocrine wallop, and what that exactly means. Now, for my explanation of that, I'm going to borrow pretty heavily from a paper titled Stress and the Neuroendocrine System, the Role of Exercise as a Stressor and Modifier of Stress. And it says, Stress is something experienced by all of us, no matter who we are, and it has both a positive and a negative effect on our lives. Our society has created an environment where there are tremendous opportunities to experience both negative stresses, distress, as well as positive stresses, you stress on a daily basis. Such stressful encounters have profound impacts on the physiological workings of the human body, both in constructive and destructive fashions. One physiological system that is extremely reactive to stress is the neuroendocrine system. In fact, many clinicians and researchers use the responses of the neuroendocrine system as a means of assessing the stress effects and reactivity of the human body. So, physical exercise is an activity that is known to provoke large and diverse stress responses within the neuroendocrine system. However, chronic exercise training is also known to cause abatement, or a decline, 
in the stress responses of the neuroendocrine system to certain forms of stress. So if we go back to the CrossFit statement of it's going to elicit a substantial neuroendocrine wallop, we can extrapolate from what we just learned that applying just enough stress to the neuroendocrine system can be very beneficial, but applying too much of a wallop would actually cause the strength, the muscle growth, and the fitness gains to slow and perhaps even stop. So how exactly does CrossFit wallop your neuroendocrine system? I mean, this walloping doesn't sound like something you can do with a yoga class or even training for an ultra marathon. But before we get to that, let's look at the second part of the CrossFit doctrine statement. Packs an anabolic punch. Okay, first, what does anabolic mean, and do I really want to get punched in it? <laughs> Let's start by defining the terms anabolic and catabolic. Now, being in a catabolic state means that your body is breaking down tissue. When you exercise, you cause tiny tears in your muscle. The longer and harder you work out, the more damage you cause to your muscle tissue. Catabolism can be thought of as your body basically wasting away. Three factors contribute to a catabolic state. Not getting enough exercise or movement, not eating enough nutrient-rich food, and not getting sufficient amounts of rest. An easy way to remember this is that in a catabolic state, you run the risk of your body cannibalizing muscle. It's kind of gross, isn't it? But anyway, let's move on. Being in an anabolic state now means that your body is building or repairing tissue. When you give it an opportunity, like taking a recovery or a rest day, your body focuses on your damaged muscle tissue and works to repair it. An interesting side note is that it's actually during this rest period, not during the exercise itself, when you actually put on all your beefcakey size. Anabolism is achieved through three major factors getting an appropriate amount of exercise or movement, eating enough nutrient-rich food, and getting sufficient amounts of rest. So, in a nutshell, the anabolic state acts as the complete opposite of the catabolic state. Okay, so returning to the CrossFit statement of packs an anabolic punch that puts on impressive amounts of muscle, we can see that the copywriters at CrossFit are being a little loose with their terms here. Not that it's completely incorrect, but it would be more accurate for them to say that CrossFit packs a catabolic punch that puts your body into an anabolic state that in turn helps you pack on an impressive amount of muscle. You can see why they didn't hire me to do their marketing strategy. I mean, I'm accurate, but I'm not exactly catchy. So how do they deliver this anabolic punch, and how is it different from your typical gym? Well. Instead of lines of elliptical trainers, stationary bikes, treadmills, universal machines, and dumbbell racks, you'll find in a CrossFit box barbells, plates, platforms, ropes, rings, jump ropes, medicine balls, kettlebells, and many more bars to perform pull-ups on than at your local 24-hour fitness. Okay, now let's talk about something called a wad. At the CrossFit box, you'll do what's called a workout of the day, which has been given the unfortunate acronym WAD, which usually includes something called a METCON, a metabolic conditioning session. So how does a WAD work? Well, typically a gym, a website, or a newsletter will post a daily WAD, often with variations for various levels of fitness, and you simply look at what's posted, and do the appropriate workout for your own ability, which immediately assumes that you have some decent self-awareness and minimal ego, or you'll end up injured. In this Metcon wad, the group tries to get as many rounds or reps as they can in a set amount of time. The moves, the lifts, rounds, reps, and various other details of the workout may vary from wad to wad, so your muscles and your nervous system are always in a state of confusion which is a good thing, mostly. And again, the Hemsworth-esque salesman at my local CrossFit box said that one day you could run 400 meter sprints and do 100 pull-ups, and the next day you might do kettlebell swings, rowing, and a bunch of box jumps. As I found out in my first session, CrossFit pushes you beyond what you might normally do in a weight room at the YMCA. 
instead of doing three sets of 10 of this, 12 of that, and 15 of the other thing, and then stopping, you keep doing it over and over again until time runs out. This is what they mean when they say that you're doing the workout for time. So once again, returning to their sales pitch, we can now verify that by confusing your nervous system and your muscles by throwing a different workout at them each time you do your wad, and by doing everything for time and attempting to beat that time each time you step into the CrossFit box, you certainly are walloping your neuroendocrine system and punching your anabolism. But is this really going to pack on muscle and build strength in the best, the fastest, and safest way possible? Well, I want to dig into a 2009 paper called Molecular Responses to Strength and Endurance Training, Are They Incompatible? from the RMIT University, which found combining resistance exercise and cardio in the same session may disrupt genes for anabolism which is a fancy way of saying that combining endurance and resistance training impaired muscles' ability to fully adapt to either. The study also found that doing cardio before resistance training suppressed anabolic hormones, such as IGF-1 and MGF. And, to top it off, doing cardio after doing resistance training actually increased muscle tissue breakdown. Several other studies found similar outcomes. A study called Concurrent Strength and Endurance Training from Molecules to Man found that activation of AMP-K by endurance exercise may inhibit signaling of the protein synthesis machinery by inhibiting the activity of mTOR and its downstream targets. Other studies from the Waikato Institute of Technology and the University in Finland agreed that training for both endurance and strength simultaneously impairs your gains on both fronts. So, does this mean CrossFit won't do anything for strength and endurance? Well, no. Any workout with some intensity combined with the right amount of rest will certainly benefit your fitness level. But, if you truly want to hulk up, and yes, I said hulk, not bulk, or if you want to really max out your aerobic capacity, science says that CrossFit is not your first choice. Science says that the most effective way to both build strength and improve aerobic endurance is to separate your weightlifting from your cardiovascular exercise. So, how does CrossFit's mission statement stack up now? <laughs> well, Let's try another rewrite. This is what I've got now. The CrossFit protocol can elicit a substantial neuroendocrine wallop if you have the self-awareness to push just hard enough and, if done correctly, packs a catabolic punch that elicits an anabolic response that can put on some muscle, but not as much muscle as you would if you weren't also maxing out your cardiovascular system. Wow, I think I have a hit on my hands. A couple of weeks have passed since my first CrossFit workout, and I'm now waiting for an introductory session to start. In preparation for my sessions, I'm studying some Olympic lifts, and I actually went out and purchased a jump rope, because embarrassingly enough, doing 100 jumps was actually the most vomit-inducing part of the workout for me, and that will not stand. But like many things in the fitness world, skipping has a lot to do with efficiency, and I was clearly not being efficient. So I've been skipping rope a few times a week now, and I can nearly do a hundred without feeling my breakfast sneaking back up from whence it came. But I have to admit that I'm already planning to take more days off than your normal crossfitter might, and if I don't see the gains that I'm hoping for, I will likely add in some heavy lifting days. And if my 10k running time starts to falter or my hill climbing ability on the bike starts to wane, I will also add in some sport-specific workouts. Now, for those of you who are interested, my week will probably look something like this. Day number one, CrossFit plus an easy recovery run. Day number two, CrossFit plus a short swim or some bike intervals. Day three, rest. Just some foam rolling or maybe I'll go for a massage. Day four, lift heavy and no cardio. Day five, back to CrossFit plus an easy recovery run. Day six, a long aerobic run or bike session followed by some swim drills. And day seven, rest. 
I will also strive to be the guy at the back of the class who is more preoccupied with form than reps, recovery than wads, and I hope to never, ever look like the unofficial CrossFit mascot, Pukey the Clown, if I can help it. If you're a die-hard CrossFit fan, or if you have some questions about whether CrossFit is right for you, join in the conversation at facebook.com slash getfitguy, or at twitter.com slash getfitguy, or head over to quickanddirtytips.com and look for this episode of The Get Fit Guy. It's episode number 348. Now, my name is Brock Armstrong, and I am The Get Fit Guy, asking you, what are you waiting for? Go get fit.